I'm getting really close to the end now, just a couple more things left to do. But I think I'll start by fitting all the cooling hoses. This gearbox is water cooled and these are the cooling pipes which are needed to connect it into the system. And as usual they are in need of a little TLC. And here they are screwed into the gearbox. Now they should bolt together at those tab points but as you can see I've had to rotate the kinked one just so it clears at all. Ideally it wants bending back fully to its original shape but I didn't want to fatigue the metal more than I needed to as these were the only ones I had so if it did crack it would have been game over. The top and bottom rad hoses have a small T piece which shoot off from the main pipe and these simply push onto the steel part. They'd both been cut in the past and one of them now wasn't long enough so I've had to extend it with another short bit of hose and a straight coupler. Right, next up, gearbox oil. Now these gearboxes actually have two separate compartments which require independent oils. I'm starting with the main compartment first and the drain plug for that is located just behind the steering rack. And a new oil plug should hopefully prevent any leaks. The fill point is located directly above the drain plug. To fill these I use an oil syringe with a long hose which is perfect for getting the oil in the gearbox and not all down your arm. They hold about half a litre so you need to repeat it several times to get the right amount. Now from the factory the main compartment was filled with Tranself TRX80W but this is no longer made now so an alternative has to be found. I use a straight EP80 mineral oil which is the closest to the original one that I've found. It's a GL4 grade which means that it's safe for use in older gearboxes with yellow metal components. Quite a few people think you should use a GL5 grade oil as this is rated for even higher pressure applications which sounds great but the problem with GL5 is that it eats yellow metals which is typically found in old gearboxes. Now the original Tranself didn't actually have a GL rating so all we can do is use the highest pressure rated oil we can which is safe on yellow metals and basically that's GL4. I'll leave a link in the description to where I purchased the oil. Now this compartment takes 1.8 litres of oil which equates to roughly three and a half syringes worth. 
But the fill port also acts as an overflow indicator, so assuming the van is on flat level ground, then it should just start to overflow when it reaches full. And again, in an effort to prevent any leaks, I'll fit a new oil plug. The other part which needs oil is the final drive compartment. This houses the diff and it drives the output shafts either side. The drain plug is right at the bottom and is accessed through the hole in the subframe. The fill point is located on the front face in between the two coolant pipes. Now this compartment actually uses a different oil to the main one and Renault specify Tranself TRX 80W140. And this can be GL5 as of course there's no yellow metal in this part of the gearbox. Now technically this is also discontinued but the last time I checked there was someone on eBay selling off some old stock so I'll link to that in the description. Once that supply runs out then the nearest oil I've found is a 75W140 which I'll also link to in the description. Now the amount of oil required here actually depends on the climate the van is exposed to. Renault specify 1.3 litres for hot countries and 1.45 litres for cooler countries. Now all the figures I've quoted here come directly from the traffic handbook and are specific to this particular gearbox. They do vary for the other types so I'll write up a quick guide in the description covering all the various options. Right, the final thing to do on the gearbox is to refit the breather pipes. These bungs were to stop any water getting in when I pressure washed it earlier on. I've given these a blow through with the airline just to make sure there's no dirt inside. And these pipes just terminate in a grommet in one of the chassis rails. Right, I think we're done underneath now. This little part is up next and if I'm being completely honest I'm not exactly sure what it's for. But connecting it's very simple, there's just two air hoses which go onto the inlet manifold. Right, time to fill up the cooling system. I'm just going to put plain water in it for now as if there are any leaks I don't want to waste the antifreeze mix. Now the traffic engines are notorious for getting airlocks and the single biggest cause of this in my experience is simply down to people not bleeding the system properly. The header tank is secure to the bulkhead with rubber straps which means you can lift it out for better access. But it also allows you to raise it up so it becomes the highest point in the system. You can hear when I do this the water now gurgles down easily. And this is the part which often gets forgotten. The later models also had a bleed screw on the top hose, so I'll open that as well to help get rid of any air. 
Earlier vans without the bleed screw can sometimes be a bit reluctant, even with raising the tank. So the other trick you can do is to press your mouth over the hole and blow, but only do this when it's cold, obviously. I do occasionally have to do this on my other van when it really doesn't want to play ball, but this one looks like it's going pretty easily. It's just a case of repeating the process several times until no more air comes out. Oh, and it's worth mentioning you want the heater valve open when doing this, so you want to set the lever inside to the hot position. This allows the water to flow easily around the heater matrix. There is also a bleed screw at the top of the matrix, but to be honest I've never found it necessary. As long as the tank is higher than the matrix then it should just self bleed. It's also worth mentioning that the very early vans had a different header tank, which I'm not as familiar with, so this may not be applicable in those instances. Right, time to start the engine and get the water circulating. Once I've fitted the battery, of course. Because watering cans don't really have the necessary amps, do they? And yes, I know it's the wrong size. I'll get another one before I go out on the road with it. It's just for test purposes. Right, hopefully the water's already reached the pump, so that should now be circulating. So I'll keep filling it until it reaches the full mark and there's no more air at the bleed screw. Yeah, there we go. It's just starting to dribble out from the bleed screw now. Of course the thermostat may not have opened yet, so I'll check the level again before I take it out on the road. Right, next up is the radiator fan. The 2.2 needs a stronger fan than the 1.7, and although I haven't got an original, I have managed to find this one, which is from an old Subaru. If it can cool a 2 litre boxer, then I'm sure it'll be good enough for this. I just need to work out how to mount it now. and a bit of heat shrink should help keep the elements out. And because I'm a complete idiot, I forgot to fit the fan switch in the radiator before filling it up with water, so off comes the bottom hose again. The blank in the radiator comes out using an Allen key, and the new fan switch can then be screwed in. This is the later style switch with the waterproof plug. The earlier ones had exposed spade terminals which can suffer with corrosion.
One last thing to do is to remove the choke cable as of course this is now redundant. The cable mounts through the lower shroud around the column and is much easier to free with the shroud off. There's two screws on the column itself and there's one either side to secure it to the dashboard. The upper and lower parts are then pulled apart and all that remains is to carefully free the locating pins either side. There should also be a wire on the cable which feeds the light on the dash but that had already fallen off here in the past. To free the cable from the shroud it's just a case of pressing the two tangs with a pair of pliers. And now the shroud can go back on. Right, time to put the front end back together.
Right, I've spun the van round so I can now get to the back box. This is also second hand, but again, it's perfectly usable, so I might as well get a few more years out of it. And to fully seat the pins on the hanger, I found the best way is to use a quick clamp to pull it over into position. I guess I'd better do the obligatory wobble test. Yep, that's not going anywhere. Ah, air filter. Yes, I completely forgot about that. This is the original air filter housing, and with it in the right position, I can clamp it in with a rubber strap. This inlet pipe came with a donor engine, and after a quick clean, it hasn't come up too bad, actually. Okay, I think it's time to venture out of the garage. So, here we are out on the road. Just coming up to four seats, pulling really well in the fifth. So far, so good. I'm hoping that the idle will settle down, but we'll see what it's like when I get sort of into town a bit more. Yeah, it's pulling really, really well. It's a good engine. I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Whoa! Thank you very much. At least I know the brakes are good. the speed limit for me along here in a van is 50 anyway but um, I'm sure it would do 60 easily. Obviously being on the Isle of Wight we haven't got any motorway so I can't do 70 but um, I'm sure it would do that as well. See if the idle's any better. Yeah, it doesn't seem bad actually. Doesn't seem bad. No, it did rate. No, no, no. It is still. It's raising and then lowering and raising and lowering. So it's something. It could be. Could be a sensor that's full in the ECU. Could be the idle control valve that's sticking a bit. Maybe. Not sure. This is a good engine though. Yeah, that's pulling really, really well. I'm very happy with that. There's plenty of power there. Yeah, everything's up to temperature now. Gauge is looking good. No signs of overheating or anything like that, which is I was slightly concerned about because that radiator is the earlier, smaller one that the 2.2 used. But um, yeah, it all seems fine. It all seems absolutely fine. So even in fifth, going up this hill, it's pulling fine. It's pulling absolutely fine. One thing I haven't done yet, of course, is put any antifreeze in because if there are any leaks anywhere in any of the pipes, because obviously they're all the old pipes, um, then uh, there's no point wasting any antifreeze. I mean, the temperatures aren't that cold at the moment, so um, it's not too much of a problem. But when I get back, I will check all of them, make sure there's no cracks or anything, make sure there's no leaks anywhere. I, mean, I did have a good look through them all before, but. And it needs the tiniest little pinhole to leak, so uh, fingers crossed they're all okay. 
and if they are, then uh, that's great. I'll, I can drain the system, put some antifreeze in, put, put the proper mix in. Don't need to go too far, so I'll probably pull in now and turn round. What a lovely view. Get used to it on the Isle of Wight, but um, yeah, lovely really. Sun visors are never in the right place, are they? I've noticed a slight whine on the gearbox. Doesn't seem too bad though, it's probably probably a bearing that's just ever so slightly starting to go, maybe, I don't know, but for the use that I'm gonna give to this fan, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Bloody sun. Mind you, it's better than rain than that, I suppose. Noticed actually, it's a little bit hesitant just on deceleration. They're kind of like on overrun. Quite sure if I'm, if I'm imagining it or if there is an issue there. I don't know. Just seem to sort of not pick up, you know, as as much as you like. Just seem to sort of jolt a bit, be a bit hesitant, I suppose, or. Um, Maintaining 40 up this steep hill, which it wouldn't have done with a 1.7. Splashy still, it is. Whoa, what was that? Whoa, it's, yeah, it's definitely got like a jolt problem. Doesn't seem to like lifting off, so going on to over or into overrun, it doesn't seem to like that for some reason. I'm trying to get, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, does not like, okay, what's that then? Let's try it again here a little bit. Oh yeah, no, okay. Yeah, does not like that. Right, that's a bit odd. So it seems, yeah, I mean it's a slow speed really, it's not, it's not at high speed, or maybe it, it is, it's just that the momentum keeps it going and you don't notice it, I don't know, but um, yeah, that's, that's a weird one that is. Could be a fueling issue, maybe the ECU or something, it's probably like a sensor maybe, that's just sending some duff information at the wrong point for the ECU, you know, and it's making it too lean maybe, or I don't know, it's like it's it's like it's shutting the fuel off, if that makes sense. It's kind of kind of weird, really. It's not ramping it down, it's just cutting it off, you know. Well, 
I sort of hoped that this would be the last bit of the video really but um, it does look like there's going to have to be some more so um, I'll get this back to the workshop start fault finding I suppose just go through it all I mean there's no diagnostic port so you're, you're on your own really in terms of fault finding but um, I'll do my best I've got a couple of ideas where to start but uh, overall it's a good engine so it's just a few little niggles to sort out but um, overall I'm very happy so uh, yeah thanks for watching everyone and um, I'll see you next time I've spent an awful lot of time on this now and I'd really like to find the solution. For those of you thinking I can't see what he's doing, well don't worry because I can't either. Turns out I'm a complete idiot. We're doing 30, I'm just going to try and ease off. 